So for this week, we're going to talk about some of the concepts we didn't quite cover from the last chapter. Remind me after class so I don't mark you absent. <laughs> so we're going to talk about a couple of the th concepts we didn't cover last Thursday. Uh, and then we'll roll right into talking about uh, ethics, research ethics. Did you guys notice that I have like slogans on the syllabus? You guys picked up on that? Like, so every week we actually answer a couple of questions, right? So pointing out this week's is uh, how not to be a jerk while doing research. So like if you want to do research in a way that's ethical and sound and good to your subjects, like this is gonna be the week where we cover that. But there's a few concepts we should grab particularly the stuff on operationalization and then the stuff on level of analysis. So, so, so operationalizations, are in essence the shift from having a conceptual definition To an operational definition. That was the one up there, right? That's the one. Yeah, that was that. Just making sure. So, a conceptual definition is what we're used to thinking about when we think about definitions, right? So, what is a debt like? Do you think about like in a textbook or? You know, if you're reading an article and they give you a definition of something, that's conceptual. It says, conceptual definitions answer the question, what do we mean by whatever, right, X? You know, so if we have a conceptual definition of race, teach race and ethnicity before this, so I'll probably grab a lot of examples. Tongue, but. So the conceptual definition of race would be like, what do I mean when I say the word race, right? An operational definition is different. An operational definition is the answer, it essentially is telling us how I am measuring X, right? So how are we measuring it? That's going to be your operational definition. So this is particularly important in statistical kind of research, that you develop a sound operational definition, right? So how are you going to measure x, y, and z? And this can be as simple as, you know, you're measuring it as Subjects, response to a question, right? So in this example of race being our, right? And so by race I mean uh, categories of ethnicity is defined by biological differences. Right? That's my definition, right? So biological differences between people are used to define what one group from another, right? How I operationalize that is my subject's response onto the question, where I ask them the question race, and then give them a bunch of categories that they can define it as, right? So if you think about like, this is essentially the conceptual definition of race on every government document you've ever done, right? That would be the operationalization. Or it can be something more complex. Right? We're going to look at a lot of ways in which you can get more complex, nuanced, operational definitions. As in, like, you could do a series of questions that you combine into one thing, right? Or you could, you know, operationalize it in very different ways, right? You could operationalize it if you're doing qualitative on either your answers to a question or on just your observation, right? But observational definitions is always how will I measure, how will I observe, right, this. Because often, 
Well, we, we're inter the reason why we make this distinction is a lot of times we're interested in concepts that don't really have definitions. You know, not don't have clearly, or sorry, we're interested in concepts that don't really have clear measurable things, right? So like any abstract concept, right? So like if you're interested in, I don't know, like if this was a poli sci class and you're interested in questions about liberty, right? Liberty is a very abstract concept, but if you're going to make some sort of empirical claim about liberty, like, you know, uh, you know, liberty makes people happier or whatever, right? You're going to have to actually find a way to define how you're going to measure that phenomenon, right? So that's, this is the step where you figure that out. Um, once again, like everything else, you do this partially so that people are very clear on what you did, so that they can critique it. Because a lot of times, like, you'll find in a lot of research, people's operational definitions don't really seem to match what they're trying to study at all. Right? A uh, good example of this, often because, so if you were to use something like, uh, if you're doing a statistical study and you were using census data and you're interested in questions of race, you're going to have a problem because they don't ask that question. Right? Um, so you might have to use some sort of dummy variable. Actually, I got that backwards. They don't ask questions about class. So if you're interested in social class, a lot of people will use race as their operationalization of class, which is kind of an inaccurate, right, uh, operationalization. A lot of people who, you know, come from one racial group or another are not poor. So, like, how can we maintain that operationalization, right? So there's a lot of questions about that, in particular when you get into things like most people aren't going out and collecting surveys. And actually, most statistical survey, statistical research is just done on flat out government data. You know, and often that involves very, very like sometimes imprecise manipulations of questions to try to get to the answer. Right. So that's a uh, so that's operationalization. I'm not really sure why the author brings this up in the middle of a paradigm chapter, but it's a really important concept that as we move forward, we're going to have to figure out. Like, what, even within our own research, how we're going to operationalize the things that we are interested in. Right, so like somebody throw out what their study is on, that we talked about. What's your topic? Somebody who had like a really, do you remember, how about you we go with your topic? Uh, uh, Jewish history. Correction, uh, violent acts against inmate, inmate to inmate, Related to gang yeah. related to gang Sorry, I kind of put you on the spot, didn't I? <laughs> and I totally forgot it. Sorry. So I remembered if this helps. <laughs> you were going to talk about like where people are put in prisons and whether that results in violent outcomes, right? Uh, so like, in some ways, you're going to have to operationalize what you mean by being placed by gang affiliation, right? You're even like. Some of you are going to have to operationalize gang affiliation. Like, what do you mean by that? So, in reality, you'll probably provide a conceptual definition. This is what I mean by gang, right? A gang is, I don't know, a group of people who get together to, I don't know, provide community for one another while they commit, commit you know, illicit acts that the US government says is legal or whatever you want to define gangs as, right? Then you're going to have to provide, I'm going to operationalize this by a question, are you in a gang? If so, please fill in gang membership. <laughs> or like, I don't know, their gang membership card, whatever, right? <laughs> like, like, I'm not saying there's such a thing, but, you know, so in a sense, it's like how you're going to operationalize that, right, will determine, and in a lot of ways, it'll determine what you get. So that's something, a step that we're all going to have to kind of learn to take as uh, we move forward, because by the end of the project, we'll be expected. Okay, so any questions on operationalization? Is everyone clear on that? I take long pauses to make sure people are actually clear. I know method, you kind of function in this very abstract, yet super concrete, rigid world. It's kind of weird. Okay, let's, let's talk about level of analysis. There's something else that gets brought up in that.
So in sociology, there's three basic levels of analysis, which is like, where does my, where does the phenomenon at what scale, right, from large to small? That's a good way to think of what scale from large to small does the phenomenon I'm interested in exist? Does that make sense? So it can be micro, meso, or macro. And it's really important to be able to identify what level of analysis you're studying. Because it, it's, there's problems if you move between them. We'll see how that works. So, macro level is sort of like our large institutional level. Right? So, if you were to think about theories that function at a macro level, it's going to be things like Marxism, where we talk about how is it that economies change over hundreds of years. That's a very macro theory, right? Um, so like that's going to be your big level of analysis. Things that involve things like governments, economies, right? Long flows of history, all that sort of <coughs> stuff is going to be your macro level. A lot of sociology functions way up there, right? Like if you take classes, look. So even more so if you're talking about, so like for those of you who are criminologists, I think criminology has a tendency more often to fall on these two levels. But like something like critical criminology would be way up here, right? Uh, where you're talking about large institutional changes over time. So meso is kind of in between, and we think of meso as the group level. You know, so like if we're studying a specific group of people or we're interested in ways in which individual groups of people within, you know, a given government, within a given place, interact with one another, that would be our meso level of analysis. This could be things like studying towns, right? Uh, if you're interested in, so even thinking, so if you're interested in like, you know, one town has this policy, another town has this policy, how does that change them? That would be a very meso level analysis. Make sense? So mesos groups. Macro is the level at which we study mostly human interactions and human identities. So if you're interested in, you know, what being homeless does for somebody's identity. Right, that's going to be at a micro level, you know. It's going to be the smallest level of analysis. Make sense? Can people people think of examples from? Let's try to get examples from you all at each level. So, what would might, what might be a macro level of analysis? What might be something you've read or interacted with in a class? It happens at the macro level. What about world prisons? What's up? World prisons. So, like, you mean like differences between prisons globally? Correct. Yeah, so, like, yeah, if you were to do a comparative study, in fact, uh, you know, somebody just gave me a book to look over that was a comparative study of prisons from France to South America to China to the United States, right? That would be a very macro level analysis. How is it, especially like if you're thinking about differences of it over time, right? It's going to be very macro. Yeah, this would be an example. What would be an example of a micro level? Yeah, yeah. How do people negotiate the identity of being in prison would be a good, good, good micro kind of study. What might be a meso kind of study? This is the hardest to define because it's kind of like it's in between the two, right? Maybe like studying like specific groups in prison, like who was authored Yeah, like yours would be a meso level analysis. Yeah, so like you're interested in groups, the individual inmates that belong to your gangs, like you couldn't, you're, you're not really exploring like 
how they think how they're thinking about themselves right you're not you're not exploring like how Russian gangs uh, work in prison versus United States gangs work in prison instead you're looking at it at that group level right the mesoanalysis the reason why it's so important to identify is there's two logical problems that happen when you leap between levels of analysis one is called the ecological fallacy and the other is called reductionism or sometimes also called the reductionist fallacy So you can never say what happens at a larger level of analysis is true of everybody. So this, when I criticize operational operationalizations of class on the basis of race, I was accusing them, right, of committing the ecological fallacy. Just because most minorities are poorer than most than white than Caucasians does not mean that you that somebody who is a minority is poor. Right? That would be an ecological fallacy. You can't move from the larger level of analysis to the small, right? Otherwise, you're making an assumption that's false, right? So that's ecological fallacy. So you can't assume, you know, so like you think about like, a good example would be is like, you know, Scandinavian politics. Scand most Scandinavian countries are socialist countries, right? In their organ organization. That doesn't mean that if you meet a Scandinavian, you can assume he's a socialist, right? If you've done that, you've committed the ecological fallacy. In the same way, what's true of the parts of something is not necessarily true of the whole, right? So you can't move from, I don't know, like individual. This is the basic argument, like, have you ever heard uh, the idea of institutional racism? Institutional racism says our system is racist. That doesn't mean that the people within it are, right? You can have a system, which we can debate whether that's true or not, right? But we have, you can have, a, you could at least hypothetically have a system where you don't have barely anybody who's racist, and yet the system itself is, right? And that would, that's because it's a reductionist argument to assume that because something is true here, that it's true here, right? You could even say that things like most people's attitudes in the United States might have nothing to do with some things that our government does, right? Because we're largely unaware of it, right? The ecological fall or the, or it's a reductionist fallacy is it's true of the parts, is true of the whole, right? This is often like the critique of things like this is a psychology class. Cognitive science often has a reductionist fallacy to it and gets accused of that because it's basically like you use people's neurons to understand the entire human being, right? So you've taken that person out of the social context, out of their everything else, right? And just reduce them down to, their, to, to one cell system in their entire body, right? That's committing a reductionist fallacy, um, right? So you hear people talk about that when people use biological explanations. So for those of you who are in Korean, we start with a harassment of biological explanations in Korean theory, right? Biological explanations of human behavior often fall in reductionist fallacies. Make sense? Okay, cool. Any questions about level of analysis? Thoughts? Yes. Is reductionism basically just the opposite of Ecological fallacy? Yep, yep. So they're the opposite okay. of each other. So, yeah, ecological fallacy is big to small, small to big to reductionist. All that clear? Okay, let's get back. It's really important to know ethics research ethics if you're going to do research. More so than it, it is to know business ethics to do business. Right? So if you're a, bit, you're a business major and you have to take business ethics, after you learn business ethics, you can just throw it out the window and do whatever the heck you want in the world, right? 
In business ethics, you cannot do that. Nothing will shut your research down quicker than doing unethical research. Uh, and it's mainly because this is all watched very closely by actual agencies within schools that determine whether or not you can do research. And in fact, anyone receiving government money to do research has to file with something called an IRB board, an Institutional Review Board. So even if you're like, belong to some think tank or something like that, that think tank has to have a review board that reviews the research and makes sure that it's ethical. And a lot of times IRB also becomes shorthand for the paperwork you have to file, so if you ever know any actual researchers, they'll throw around talking about their IRB. And what they really mean is their, uh, the, the, all the paperwork you have to file. You guys are actually going to file, you're not going to file, you're going to fill out the paperwork for an IRB towards the end of the semester when you have your research design done. Uh, you will not actually have to file that. In fact, it would be very confusing if you did. Now, if you go ahead and hit it, perform your research for like a discovery day project or something like that, you will have to follow that. So, so yeah, the IRB is who sort of governs ethical research. That's composed of a combination of people from your own institution, as well as at least one outside member who has to not be a researcher, who has to not be an intellectual, who can't have any connection or like really any, any like course that show. And it can be anybody. So at my last institution, they were short a member on the IRB and they needed somebody who was outside. And I actually had my neighbor who's a who's a, a rural letter carrier. And he was on the IRB board for our college for two years, right? So any research that got done, he had stamped that as okay or it couldn't go through. You know, so like the basically that IRB is in charge of making sure that everybody does everything ethically. So so yeah, if you ever go to do research, only research on real human subjects. So if you're doing research where you use government data, or if you're doing research where like, I do research mostly on historical documents produced by people who've been dead for 100 years. So like, I can do whatever I want. It's public stuff, it's public found stuff. Same with like, my dissertation was on flash mobs and I basically did like, I did a study of basically YouTube videos of flash mobs, and like none of that had to go through the IRB because I just found it on the internet. I didn't have to actually have human subjects. But most research done in the social sciences involves human subjects and goes through the IRB. Okay. All that makes sense? Cool. So what are the what are the rules? So one of the rules is is that you have to have voluntary participation. Did you guys catch what that means from the textbook? What's voluntary participation? What does it mean that your subjects have to have voluntary participation? Nobody. Go, go ahead. Nobody can be forced to do it. You can't force or pay anybody. Yeah, you can't force. You can't pay. Right? People to be your research subjects. You can't put them in any sort of condition where they have to do it or something will happen to them, right? So any form of coercion, uh, it would make it uh, unethical. So this is also like, there's things like, you know, back in the day before IRB boards, you know, medical studies, sometimes they would deny you care if you didn't participate in research. Can't do that. Um, it's unethical. So you have to be a voluntary participant have to choose to do it. Okay. This one seems obvious. Ethical research does no harm to subjects. So you cannot harm your subjects. It sounds obvious, but there used to be a lot of research where people did harm their subjects. 
our, uh, um, our textbook talks about some. Does anybody know any classic examples of people harming their subjects in the study? Could you say the Stanford experiment could be Oh, we're going to talk about the Stanford experiment. I, I, that's debatable, right? But we'll talk about Milgram's, Milgram's experiment in that a little later. No, Stanford is Stanford Milgram, or Stanford the prison study. The prison study. The prison study. Okay. Does anybody know the Stanford prison study? Yes. Yeah. Does anybody want to real quick reiterate, just in case anybody here? What the? Yeah. Go ahead. They had like the prisoners and the guards, and they were all students. And then at the end of it, like the guards actually started to act like guards and like, beat up the prisoners, and they got really out of control. Yeah, so why would that be, why, why would we argue that, could, why would that, why would we argue that that harms the subjects? Okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you could say that they put people in position of power that would potentially actually physically harm the prisoners. Yeah, so well, does it have to be physical? No, so, emotional. Any form of harm, right. physical, Emotional, right? Even down to minor things. You have to, you have to be very like. And we, we're going to talk about informed consent. You have to be very precise on any form of danger that people might have as a result of your, of your, uh, of your experiment. So yeah, emotional, physical harm. You can technically do some harm to your subjects, right? But it has to be balanced where they actually receive a benefit greater than the harm. So that's often in medical terms, that's actually, because like, you know, sometimes medical procedures is literally harming the body, right? But like, they have to receive greater benefit than the harm. Rarely in research, social research, can we make any claim to give people something greater than their harm, so it's actually quite difficult to, to overcome that if you're gonna enact any harm. So, and that can even be like, you might get, you might, and, IRBs reject studies all the time with revisions. So like, it might be that like you have a question, and this is good, might be true, like, if you're somebody who studies sexual assault, this could be a great example, right? You can argue that there's a benefit to the subject in like creating political awareness and stuff like that, but you may very well have sent that to the IRB and they're like, that question you can't ask. That question you can't ask, right? And then you might have to just reword the question to make it less like raw or whatever, right? But like, it's often like very, very clearly like any sort of minor harm, emotional, physical, etc. Right? You don't have to. Um, you don't have to. Do okay, I already mentioned informed consent. <coughs> So informed consent, did anybody catch what informed consent means? Yeah. Yeah, you have to you have to inform them of the full array of risk. You have to inform them what your study's about. Right? You have to inform them on pretty much everything. In and they say fifth grade language. So like, if you think about the language that a fifth grader can understand, that's the, usually the language that, and you usually have a form, an informed consent form, depending on the type of research that you're doing. You have an informed consent form that people sign. That's ideally what they want. Uh, we're gonna see when you go to do your, do your uh, research design, we're gonna see what that looks like. We're gonna see that. You, you, you may or may not have to do an informed consent form. So there's certain situations where you don't have to do informed consent. So the ones where you generally do is any survey research. So if you're doing a survey, you have to give people informed consent. Right? And so far as you're receiving public funds. Interviews. Things like focus groups. Did we talk about focus groups at all? It's kind of hard. We haven't done the research, the basic research design yet. So focus groups is like, if you think about like 
marketing research often use this focus group. So if you ever seen on like TV or a movie, they mock something where they bring like ten people into a room and then they like I don't know, give them something to taste or watch, and then they like ask everybody what they thought about it. That's a focus group. Um, all this sort of stuff you're going to generally have to get informed consent. Some stuff you don't. So anything that happens in public, anything that happens in public, you do not need informed consent for. So if you want to go and sit in a park and, I don't know, count the number of times that people pick their nose, you can do that. It's perfectly, perfectly okay. You don't need to walk up to them after the fact and get informed consent. Um, but depending on what sort of setting it's in and how private it is and how at risk the population is, you might be able to do something like make observations at a church service, right, where it's public. You might be able to, like, public universities, like, people can show up at public universities and watch people and do studies that way. It's perfectly allowed in the public space, right? So it's public behavior. And this is also what, so when I said I didn't have to get permission on flash moms, the reason why I didn't have to get IRB permission is because everything I did was public. Uh, it was posted on the internet by somebody. It was readily available. Once it's made public, you can't, you know, the rules don't apply. Same thing with public figures, things that public figures say. You can quote, you can use it, you don't need anything, any permission to do that. Um, make sense? Okay, so if it's public behavior, it's an exception. Um, you don't need usually informed consent for, and we're going to look at this type of research, like ethnographic research, where you like go and live with people, right, for years, and like observe them and understand the nuance of their culture. You're generally not going to get informed consent, so you're not going to be like wandering around the whole time you're there. Sign this, sign this, sign this, right? Like that's not what you do. Instead, like you're usually allowed to skip it. Yeah, informed consent's a big thing. And generally speaking, if you can get it and it's feasible, they will want it. Uh, so the general rule, you will want. Here's a big one. Here's a big one that we don't normally. We don't think about this often because this, this shows very different rules between what academic research has to do and what something like newspapers do. So, and actually, like in some countries, when they report news, they can't use any names unless you're a public figure. So, like, if you were like in Scandinavian countries, they don't release like names of inmates or criminals and court documents. They just literally call them like, like you know, like, uh, like you know, I'm trying to think of the word for somebody uh, who's on trial, suspect number. 187AB, whatever, right? Like, and so essentially they'll just give them that random thing. And so if you ever read anything, anything like any criminological stuff from some some place like Scandinavia, like Nor Norway or Sweden, they'll quite literally just do that. One of my favorite journals is actually a Swedish journal. So for some reason, all of a sudden they randomly talk about like way they do things in Sweden. That's probably why. Up to sociology, it's a great journal. Anyways. <laughs> Um, so, we have to, as researchers, have anonymity or confidentiality. Does anybody know the difference between anonymity and confidentiality? There's um, anonymity, whatever that, I don't know what I'm saying. Anyways, the top one. Yeah. Um, isn't it where the researcher or the reader don't know who the person is doing the research on is? And then confidentiality is where the researcher knows but the person who's reading the research doesn't know? Yeah, that's exactly right. So an anonymity you don't know is a researcher. You have no clue who you're talking to or who you're not. Right? In confidentiality, you know but you don't tell. So, as a general rule, the IRB will want you to have anonymity if you can. Now, not all studies, obviously, that's possible. So, like survey research, right? If you're handing out 300 surveys, 
if you were like, I'm going to have them put their name at the top so I can call them later and ask them a question, they're going to be like, no, you can't do that, right? You need to maintain anonymity. You can't know whose responses are whose, right? Um, so anything that's large enough to actually maintain anonymity, they're going to want that. Um, confidentiality, most forms of qualitative research, you maintain confidentiality. So if you ever, I'm sure you guys, everyone here has probably read a qualitative journal article at some point, right, in your classes. If not, then you probably have not had me for another class. Um, <laughs> so qualita in qualitative research, they'll give any names of people, any names of places is always made up. Uh, they make up the names, they change their names to protect the confidentiality of people. So talking about unethical forms of research, so one of my, uh, he would actually be my graduate school advisor's advisor, it was a man named Arthur Vidic. Um, Arthur Vidic was a very famous qualitative sociologist from the 50s, and he did a study called uh, Small Town and Mass Society, where he was essentially like doing this study of small towns, right? Where he, it was one particular small town that he was doing his case study, and he was very interested in like how the individual politicians of that town interacted with like the large bureaucracy that they were within, right? Changed everybody's name, changed the name of the town, but he still managed to break this rule. Why do you think that might be? Everybody in the small town knew that Arthur Vidic was studying them, so when his book came out, they read it and they could tell who was who. <laughs> so everybody knew what everyone else was doing in the town on these things that they told Arthur Vidic. It was completely accidental, right? But it was like Harold is one of the examples of like unethical research to this day. Uh, Arthur Vidic, so a small small towns in mass society, right? So like it breaks that confidentiality, right? Okay, let's uh How could that have been avoided? What's up? How could that have been avoided? Uh well there's a lot of questions about whether like how I'm not sure you can obviously. But you may possibly like if you were like if you were from small, a small town and you wanted to study it. This might be something that an IRB would be like, uh, how do you make sure that they don't know who's who? Or like if you were to do a qualitative study here on campus, right? Let's say like you were going to study a club here on campus in your research, right? That might be a question. How are you going to maintain so that people, like, how can you make sure that nobody is going to be negatively impacted, right, by, uh, by your research? Because the, the, the difficulty, too, is like the reason why you maintain confidentiality is, like, well, pretty much everything in research ethics goes back to you're not allowed to harm your subjects, right? You can do real harm to somebody if people know who you can figure out what you're talking about. So one way to do that is also to do comparative studies. So like if you were rather than just doing like this is my the one small town I'm going to study, if you're going to like I'm going to study these three small towns, and they're all somewhere in the Midwest, right? Then you probably can get away with it a little bit easier, especially if you fluidly move between them, right? Because it's going to be very hard to tell which people are from which town and which ones you're talking about. And anything people guess would just be guesswork. So that might be a way to avoid it and protect yourself from that. Probably do better research anyways, compared to stuff that you should Okay, any questions about confidentiality and anonymity? Next we have college of account. If I ever go over, let me know. Especially considering this is class right after this and I have to disinfect. So, so okay. So what time do you want to stop to disinfect? Uh, usually five minutes before the time is supposed to fit up. So I'm looking at like 10 after is when you put a red stops. Oh, is that clock right? That is right, isn't it? Awesome. Most buildings are not. <laughs> it's kind of like we got, we got cell phones and nobody maintains clocks anymore. So it's like the assumption is we can just figure out what time it is anyway. So 
Yeah, you go to BC maintenance and send out a work order, they'll come and say. They will come and fix this? Okay, cool. I'm going to have to keep start keeping track of which yeah. classrooms are broken in. Okay. So, the next one is deception. They do not want you to use any deception, usually. It's kind of weird. We call this ethics. I always think of ethics as things that are debated. Like, is it right or wrong to X, Y, and Z? And then when you get to like research ethics, which is funny because we like debate everything in sociology, right? But then you get to ethics and it's just like, nope, this is how you do it. This is what the IRB calls out that ball. I always thought that was weird, but anyways, so it's funny. Um, IRB um, usually will not want you to do any form of deception. So some, like we mentioned briefly before, the Stanley Milgram study. I did because I thought you were talking about, when you talked about the Stanford Prison Study, I was thinking you were talking about this one. But does anybody know the Stanley Milgram study? This is the sh where they, they pretend to shock people. Has anybody ever seen this? Yeah, oh. yeah, yeah. So Stanley Milgram's uh, conformity study. It, does anybody, anybody remember this well enough to give the setup of what's happening in it? Um, they had like, an actor from the doctor and an actor type of person who was being shocked and they brought people in and told them like, they had to read a list of words and the person had to read them back and if they did it wrong, they had to shock them and go up an object each time. And the doctor would keep telling them like, keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going, even if they said it hurt or like, had a heart attack or whatever, even though that was like happening to the person who was in charge of the shots, who thought they were actually doing their shots, thought that they were, and they were turning someone. Yeah, yeah. Has anybody ever seen the original video? Like in the original video, the machine literally has a skull and crossbones at the highest setting. And it was something like 80% of people would go all the way to the top setting. Even though the person's like, I have a heart condition, like, I, you know, I'm gonna die, and you just, <laughs> anyways, right? And it's kind of disturbing, right? That's, there's two arguments you can make why this is unethical, and one of which is deception, right? How is this an act of deception? Because they faked it on their end to the people that they were doing. Yeah, you brought people in, and then you were like, you're doing a study on memorization. And then you fake it, right? But it's really a study on conformity, right? That's a big shift, right? So if you think about informed consent, right? Informed consent built off of this idea of deception, right? You can't deceive people about what you're going to do. Or at least, if you're going to deceive people, it cannot harm them. Because you can get exceptions to, to deception, right? So you can be like, it's necessary that they don't know, right? They have to not know something. But it better not be able to harm them in any way. And it better be pretty minor forms of deception or people are not going to be okay with this. This is a bit bigger for like experimental research because often experimental research does involve deception of the subjects. Um, so, okay, so that's one of, how else, and it's one of the ways we already talked about, how else does the Stanley Milgram study of so many? He said, how, how else? Oh, yeah, how else is it unethical? Because they said they had a doctor and they faked who this person was. If the doctor is going to do a study, it must be a doctor. Well, well, I would say, so that would fall under deception still. Okay. Okay. What other than deception? It's like emotional trauma with people doing the shocks. Yeah, yeah, you can make a strong argument that, well, in sense of self, like, here you, you went into a study thinking you were doing some like little memorization thing at Harvard, yay, right? And then like you end up leaving the building knowing that you would shock somebody to death just because like some guy in a white lab coat told you to. Like that's kind of screwed up, right? Like, and so there's a big potential for harm there. Um, as well. Okay. If you do use any form of deception, one thing you absolutely will have to do is debrief. So you will have to tell subjects about your research after the fact. Often, as well, debriefing is often something the IRB would like. It's not something that often happens, but the IRB would often like you to 
contact subjects and let them know what you did after that. Right? And in fact, like if you have subjects, according to IRB stuff, if you have subjects that request to know what you're doing or see your results, you have to share it. So you can't not share it with your subjects. Right? So, so there's that. Okay. Well, that makes sense. So those are the basic bones of, uh, of research ethics. Those are the things you have to make sure that you're doing. Okay. The last thing that we need to know about research ethics is that there are even more stringent standards sometimes. So this is like, if you're doing a study of college students in general, no specific population of them, right? Well, maybe it might fall under one of the protections. If you're doing it just like sending out surveys in the mail to random American households, right? Those would be the standards that you'd have to follow. But for certain populations, you're going to have to follow more stringent standards. So, one of which is prisoners. So you cannot, you, the, the IRB has to watch more closely and have higher standards for prisoners than the general population. Why is that? Which is why I was like, with yours, I was like, no, I don't even think, can you see why yours wouldn't be, go to an IRB now? Right? There's potential harm to people, like, Getting shanked is an extreme form of harm, man. Like, you know. And then on the other end of that, you get things like, uh, um, like, that you have a protected population. So why, 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 do, why does the IRB protect prisoners more than the general population? They, in a way, like, have less, like, freedom. Yeah, they have less autonomy. They're more easily coerced, right? Like, there's more, there's more danger to actually not following that without you even knowing you're doing it, right? So they're going to be even more stringent that you have to make sure, you know, informed consent, that you're not going to, right? Like, so all those little things that can be different, like, oh, I'm going to waive my informed consent, or I'm going to practice a little bit of deception. If you're talking about a vulnerable population, they're going to be like, no, you can't do that, right? Um, prisoners, we call them uh, children. You have to file an entirely separate set of paperwork if you're going to do stuff for children, right? Also, you're going to have to do things like, uh, like you're going to have to obtain informed consent from legal guardians, right? Stuff like that, as well as the child themselves. So children are even more protected. Any institutionalized person. Any institutionalized person has to be has to be. So that, what would be an example of an institutionalized person? Someone with mental health system. Yeah, somebody with mental health system, right? So this could be even like minor forms of that. Well some of these overlap, right? So like you could have somebody who's institutionalized in like Trying to think of something that would be an example. Well, it could be something like, you know, you have a kid in a boarding school, right? They would also be, on top of being a child, right? They'd also be institutionalized. Um, so any sort of form of institutionalization. Anyone who's disabled? Anyone who's disabled in any way, shape, or form. So physically disabled, mentally disabled, right? You're gonna have a little more, st now that doesn't mean you can't do studies on people who are physically disabled or mentally disabled. It just means that they're gonna have more stringent standards. They're gonna to wanna to really make sure that things are going as smoothly as possible. So, and things like informed consent. Can you see why informed consent is difficult if you're talking about somebody who's mentally disabled? Yeah, like, so you're going to have to really make sure that people understand, right? You're going to have to make sure that the permission that you're getting does actually cover it. Um, so anyone who is economically or socially disadvantaged. Any 
engineering and economic way are socially disadvantaged. So if you go out and you study homeless people, right, there's going to be even more, they're going to want you to take double care beyond, no, beyond what you normally would because they're a vulnerable population, they're economically disadvantaged, they're prone to being manipulated, you know. Uh, so there's more danger than you'll be able to do. So, I sometimes assign an article, I think, I think I'm actually assigning in here as an example of qualitative research. It's a study of alcoholics where somebody like hung out in bars in the morning and then just like interviewed people and figured out how they talked about themselves uh, and how they understood themselves in light of being people who got drunk at 9 o'clock in the morning before they went to work. Right? So, what is a potential danger to that study? For what we do for that? What might be a potential danger? Well, if they're, if they're still in care, I mean, that you, you're getting just like a mental patient. They don't know what they're talking about. They're just saying something that you can take advantage of while you ask the question. Yeah, yeah, so you have issues for informed consent, right? Even though, and I think they would look at it this way, even though it's not a category you normally think of, right? Nonetheless, like, there's a danger to that. Um, why else might there be a danger? Why might that be a hard study to get through? Because when I read it, I was like, I'm really surprised they ever got this through an institutional review board. <laughs> this is pretty hard potential for harm, right? Like, so, you know, somebody figures out who's talking, right, in that study, like, basically ousted somebody as an alcoholic, right? So, that's a... Uh, so, you know, they're not a traditional vulnerable population, but I think there's other groups of people that we can think of that would fit in here as well. Um, if you're going to do research in other countries, that's a heightened thing. So that's a more, that's a, especially if it's an economically depressed country, that's going to definitely be a vulnerable population. So, like, if you are an anthropologist who does studies in, you know, sub-Saharan Africa, or if you do studies in, I don't know, Bangladesh, right? Like, those are going to be generally thought of as, like, things that are going to go under more scrutiny. You also have to get permissions with whatever system their government has. So, you're going to have to file separately for both systems of government, right? Um, both systems of both follow the rules in both countries at once. So, and these are the American rules. If you go to another country, you're very likely to find a whole different set of research ethics they have to practice. Um, okay. Racial minorities, right, are another vulnerable population. Which makes sense just like it does for economic things, especially discipline. Okay, any final thoughts on research ethics? Y'all pretty clear on this? Okay. Like I said, you're gonna get a chance to kind of practice this with your own study, right? You're gonna have to be asked a whole bunch of questions from that, uh, from that, you know, the document that you're gonna have to answer about whether or not you fulfill this, how you're gonna to plan to fulfill this, how are you gonna make sure you have anonymity or confidentiality? How are you going to, right? And so essentially that's the kind of preparation. This is a big part of what it means to plan your research, you know. And when it comes to stuff you do before you actually go do your research, this is one of the most time consuming often. And it can take you three years to get IRB permission um, in some institutions, you know. So like, um, you know, it depends on, uh, you know, I, uh, when I, my master's thesis at Virginia Commonwealth that would take up to three years. So you had to like piggyback on to somebody else's research to get your thesis done because you only have two years of a master's, right? So like, otherwise you'd be just stuck there waiting for your IRB before you could actually finish it. So. Okay. Have we sufficiently, sufficiently uh, filled your guys' heads with new information? Cool. Uh, See you guys on Thursday. We're going to talk about our actual like research design act, right? So like, what are the types of research?